Last Sunday, I preached on St. Anne. We have the upcoming feast of St. Joachim on the 16th. He, with St. Anne, firstly lived in the town of Nazareth of Lower Galilee, not far from Mount Carmel. They later lived in Jerusalem, where Mary was born and raised. It was also in Jerusalem that St. Joachim and St. Anne died and were buried. A church was built in the fourth century on the site of their house. This church was likely built by St. Helena. It was known at different times by different names. St. Mary, St. Mary Ubi Nauta Est. Ubi Nauta Est translates as where Mary was born. Later, this church was known by still other names. St. Mary in Probatica, Holy Probatica, and St. Anne. Not only was this church built on the site of the house of St. Joachim and St. Anne, but their tombs were also venerated there until the end of the ninth century. At that time, the Muslims, having overtaken Jerusalem, converted the church into a Muslim school. The crypt of the tombs of St. Joachim and St. Anne was rediscovered on March 18, 1889. The feast of St. Joachim was early on celebrated by the Greek church. They observed his feast on the day after the birth of the Blessed Virgin Mary. Later, the Latin church observed a feast for St. Joachim on September 16th or sometimes on December 9th. Pope Julian II assigned the feast to March 20th, but the solemnity of the feast was suppressed for some 50, uh, was suppressed some 50 years later. Pope Gregory XV restored the solemnity of the feast in 1622. In 1738, Pope Clement XII assigned the feast to be observed on the Sunday after the Feast of the Assumption of Our Lady. Finally, on August 1, 1879, Pope Leo XIII raised the ranking of the Feast of St. Joachim to a double of the second class. The feast is observed on August 16th. There is only one ranking of a feast higher than double of the second class, and that is double of the first class. Let us reflect on the life of St. Joachim. He was also known by the name Heli. He was of the priestly tribe of Judah, of the race of David, through Nathan. St. Augustine believes that St. Anne was also of the priestly tribe. In Hebrew, the name Anne means gracious. But both St. Joachim and St. Anne were just before God whom the Jews knew by the name Jehovah. Yet it seemed as if God had not blessed them, for they had no children. Among the Jews, sterility was looked upon as a reproach. Let me quote Abbe Orsini, who in 1880 wrote a book entitled The Life of of the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God. This pious couple humbly resigned to the divine decrees, passed their days in labor, prayer, and alms deeds. Now, St. Joachim came to offer sacrifice in the temple. He was reproached by Reuben, 
who claimed that since he was childless, he was not worthy to be admitted into the temple. Joachim, in grief, did not return home, but went into the mountains to offer suppliant prayer to God. The reason for his long absence was miraculously made known to Anna, and she prayed that God would take away the curse of her sterility. If God would grant that she have a child, she promised to dedicate the child to the service of God. An angel appeared to St. Anne, saying, Anna, the Lord has looked upon thy tears. Thou shalt conceive and give birth, and the fruit of thy womb shall be blessed by all the world. An angel also appeared, giving the same promise to Joachim, who then returned to his wife. Anna gave birth to a daughter whom she named Mary, in Hebrew, Miriam. St. Anne ran out of the house to greet St. Joachim. There was an ancient belief that a child born of an elderly mother who had given up hope of having offspring was destined for some high purpose and would be blessed by all the world. After 20 years of having no children, St. Anne conceived as if miraculously. She brought forth that blessed creature who was more perfect, more holy, and more pleasing in the eyes of the Lord than all the elect put together. The predestined Blessed Virgin was born on a Saturday at daybreak in the beginning of the month of Tisri, the 8th of September. The month of Tisri begins the civil year for the Jews. According to Roman calculation, Our Lady was born in the 734th year after the founding of the city of Rome. For the Romans considered the founding of Rome as the greatest event in history. And so they calculated years using the year of the founding of the city of Rome as the starting year. Mary was born when the Jews were offering sacrifice. It was while the smoke of holocausts ascended to heaven for the expiation of the sins of the people that the predestined virgin was born who was to repair the primeval transgression. Her birth was silent and unknown like that of her divine son. Her parents were of the people although descended from a long succession of kings and led to all appearances an obscure life. This mystical rose, which St. John saw later on clothed with the sun as with radiant garments, was to expand to the burning wind of adversity upon a stem poor and despoiled. Isaiah had prophesied concerning the birth of Mary, there shall come forth a rod out of the root, out of the trunk of Jesse. Now, you commonly hear this prophecy of Isaiah as uh, this way. There shall come forth a rod out of the root of Jesse. But the Hebrew word is trunk not root. St. Jerome explains the significant meaning of the Hebrew expression. For a trunk is without branches and without leaves. St. Jerome continues, the august Mary was to be born of the race of David when that family 
should have lost its splendor and should have fallen away from it entirely. Thus, St. Jerome explains what exactly Isaiah foretold concerning the coming of the Messiah and of Mary, the mother of the Messiah. In Jewish custom, a child was given its name on the ninth day after birth. This naming of the child was ceremoniously observed as the family would assemble. The daughter of Joachim received from her father the name Miriam, Mary, which is translated from the Syriac as lady, sovereign, mistress, and which signifies in Hebrew, star of the sea. And surely, says St. Bernard, the mother of God could not have a name more appropriate, nor one more expressive of her high dignity. Mary is in fact that beautiful and brilliant star which shines upon the vast and stormy sea of the world. This divine name conceals within itself a powerful charm and one of such marvelous sweetness that we have but to pronounce it and the heart is moved only to write it and the style is adorned. The name of Mary, says St. Anthony of Padua, is sweeter to the lips than a honeycomb more flattering to the ear than a sweet song, more delicious to the heart than the purest joy. Forty days after the birth of a child, the Jewish mother would go to the temple to be solemnly purified. According to the law of Moses, the sacrifice to be offered in the temple for the firstborn was a lamb, or for the, pure, for the poor, two turtle doves. St. Anne <clears throat> gave the offering of the poor. But St. Anne, so grateful for the birth of her blessed child, could not be satisfied in offering the required holocaust in the temple. Abbe, Abbe Orsini explains, she offered to the Lord a victim more pure, a dove more innocent than those which had just fallen gasping and bleeding under the knife of the sacrificing priest. She had no votive crown of most pure gold to hang up on the partition wall of the temple. She laid at the feet of the Most High the crown of her old age, the infant with which he had blessed her life. And she solemnly engaged to bring her daughter again to the temple and consecrate her there to the service of the holy place as soon as her young reason should be able to distinguish good and evil. The father of Mary ratified this vow, which then became of obligation. Among the Jews, there were two different kinds of vows. There was the simple vow and the indispensable vow. The simple vow, known as the nadir vow, could be redeemed back after vowing something to God by this vow. That which was vowed could be redeemed back. The second kind of vow was called sherem. This was a vow of indispensable obligation. By this vow, every right to the thing which was vowed was given up. That which was vowed 
was vowed absolutely and irrevocably. Any Israelite could, by this vow, offer anything which belonged to himself, whether houses, lands, beasts, children, slaves, etc. Once this vow was made, one gave up all rights to that which was vowed. He could not, for example, revoke the vow and then sell or redeem back for his own use that which he had vowed. The Sherem vow was absolute and irrevocable. It could not be purchased back, not even at a great price. When the ceremony was finished, the couple returned to their native province, that province barren of great men, from which Israel was far from expecting a prophet. Yes, it was apparently the common opinion of the Jews that no person of importance would come forth from Nazareth. For recall when Philip told Nathanael of Christ, and Nathanael replied, Can anything good come out of Nazareth? St. John Chrysostom tells that the Jews held Nazareth in contempt and even all of Galilee because this place, Nazareth, was small and contemptible. And not only this place, but the whole of Galilee. Returning to Nazareth, St. Joachim and St. Anne re-entered their humble dwelling, ever open to the needy and the stranger. There it was that the child of benediction became, from her early years, the delight of her family, and rose up like one of those lilies of which Jesus proclaims the beauty, and which, as St. Bernard poetically says, have the odor of hope. Our Lady was gifted with the use of reason even from her infancy. Mary's reason, like the daylight of the favored regions of the sun, had scarcely any twilight and shone forth from the most tender age. The favored regions of the sun are the Arctic and the Antarctic, where the sun never, never seems to fully set. There the sun scarcely dims in dipping low upon the horizon, but then it soon rises again, renewing its shining in full splendor for another day. Their night is brief and not fully dark, but daylight, apart from briefly dimming, seems to be perpetual. Abbe Orsini describes the infancy of the Virgin. Her precocious fervor, the wisdom of her discourse at a period of life, when other children enjoy as yet but a mere physical existence, led her parents to judge that the hour of separation was come. And when Joachim had offered to the Lord for the third time from the birth of his daughter the first fruits of the harvest and produce of the small inheritance of his fathers, the pair, grateful, and resigned, took the road to Jerusalem to deposit in the sacred enclosure of the temple the treasure which the Holy One of Israel had given them. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.